in 1794, the future of the United States would be determined. The nascent United States had sent her newly trained and equipped professional force, the Legion of the United States, into the frontiers of Ohio to quell the various native uprisings and finally expel the British from what was rightfully American territory. This Legion, this novel and revolutionary army for its time, would be put to the test. If they faltered, the British would continue to hold dominion over the regions surrounding the Great Lakes. If they were defeated, it would mean the continued raids and deaths of countless settlers. General Anthony Wayne, along with a cohort of young soldiers set to rise into American legend, would set the precedent for American westward expansion in a weather-torn wooded river valley in northwest Ohio, known as Fallen Timbers. By the start of the campaign, the Northwest Indian War had been raging since nearly the conclusion of the Revolution. The Western Confederacy formed to resist the usurpation of their lands, and violence was raging between native and settlers in Ohio and Kentucky. To counter this, as well as expel the growing British influence in the area, the U.S. launched two major campaigns to subdue the Western Confederacy. The Harmar Campaign and the St. Clair Campaigns were ill-equipped and ill-trained. At the time, the Americans lacked a professional army, relying entirely on militias augmented with a small handful of federal infantrymen. Both of these campaigns were met with devastating defeat. These defeats would provide the impetus for Congress to authorize a standing army. This army would be organized as the Legion of the United States, with President Washington hand-picking General Mad Anthony Wayne to lead it. This legion was unique for its time, consisting of four sub-legions that were entirely self-sufficient with organic elements of all combat arms of their time. They were the first American combined arms formations. For more on the history of the legion and the defeats that led to these events, I go into further detail in my previous video, which is linked. After properly recruiting, training, disciplining and equipping the first true American army under the Constitution, the Legion set out in the spring of 1793. This force was now the largest and best trained army in the United States since the Revolution. The negotiations with the Confederacy soon failed, and thus General Wayne moved the Legion further into native territory. The first test of the Legion would come in June, as they reached the same site of the slaughter of the previous expedition. The Legion reached the site of St. Clair's defeat, quickly recovered the lost cannons and set about building a fort at the vulnerable spot. This fortification would be named Fort Recovery. As a reaction, the British built Fort Miami nearby. While still consolidating at Fort Recovery, the Legion came under a heavy attack by the forces of the Confederacy. Outnumbered 250 to 1200, the defenders took heavy casualties, with 40% of the Legionnaires being killed or wounded. However, they held out, with their hard-drilled discipline and martial skill combining to repel the attack. This victory exemplified the differences between the Legion and the armies of militia that campaigned in the Northwest prior. The discipline and leadership of the Legion would not allow yet another surprise attack to devastate their forces, as was the case with forces of Harmar and St. Clair. Every time the Legion stopped or made camp, they fortified their position. This effectively neutralized the most feared tactic being used by the natives, the hit-and-run camp raid. Following the defeat at Fort Recovery, cracks began to show within the Western Confederacy. Little Turtle, chief of the Miami, declared General Wayne to be the chief who never sleeps and recommended peace be made. Blue Jacket, war chief of the Shawnee, mocked Little Turtle for this opinion, resulting in leadership being relinquished to Blue Jacket, this weakened Miami participation in the alliance. In late summer, the Legion had reconsolidated and pressed the campaign forward. Buttressed by 1,000 mounted Kentucky militia, they pushed north. Every day, the Legion only marched until the early afternoon, so they could fortify their position wherever they encamped. Reminiscent of the Roman Legion from which the Legion of the United States derived its name, these fortified encampments prevented surprise attacks while resting. This made a devastating defeat, like those suffered in the two previous campaigns, nearly impossible. A stand would have to be made by the native forces on the field of battle. General Wayne and his legion neared the British Fort Miami's. This was the support base from which the British coordinated and armed the Confederacy. A British officer urged the Confederacy to choose a suitable battlefield in order to have an advantage against the certain attack by the legion. They chose an area along the Maumee River 
near present-day Toledo, where a stand of trees had been blown down by a tornado. The debris stretched for a mile, and the brush created a natural fortification. The tribal alliance, along with a company of Canadian militia, took up their positions on the 17th of August and began their fast, a tradition before a battle. The Legion advanced early in the morning on the 20th of August. It was raining that morning, so many native warriors retired to Fort Miami's to break their fast for the day, assuming that the rain would prevent a battle. Meanwhile, General Wayne was arraying his forces. The infantry was to march in compacted columns, and he distributed the dragoons and artillery in the center of the column, so they could respond to an attack from any side. A battalion of Kentucky militia screened the advance from the front. The lead militiamen were 100 yards into the center of the chosen battlefield, when the Confederacy forces opened fire. The Battle of Fallen Timbers had begun. The Kentucky militia quickly scattered and retreated. Men of the 4th Sub-Legion moved forward and engaged with the native forces. This quickly devolved into hand-to-hand -hand combat, and they too began to also withdraw, being quickly chased down by a superior number of native warriors. These withdrawing troops ran into the left wing of the Legion. They were allowed to pass through the ranks while all of the sub-legions rushed to form into fighting lines. General Wayne galloped to the sound of musket fire, where he ordered the light infantry to quickly deploy ahead of the ranks to skirmish and disrupt the native assault until lines could be properly formed. Simultaneously, the artillery was hurried to the front, where they peppered the Confederacy's charge with grape shot. The novel combined arms tactics of the Legion were on full display, and the well-organized native ambush had been effectively thrown into dismay. Following the successful repulsing of the first attack, General Wayne ordered all to charge the damned rascals with the bayonet. The dragoons immediately charged, and while they took casualties, they were supported by the advancing infantry which caused the natives to choose to flee to their rear, relatively uncontested. The legion's right side also advanced, but encountered heavy resistance. However, an element of Kentucky militia had maneuvered through the swamps along the river and flanked the enemy positions. This started a withdrawal that turned into a route for the confederated forces. The 4th sub-legion pursued with fixed bayonets. The rough terrain now turned against the natives, as they were unable to effectively reform throughout the retrograde. The Legion and their attached militia was now advancing across the entire front, pushing the native forces back toward the British Fort Miami's. Some of the Confederate forces attempted to regroup in a small ravine near the fort. An Odawa chief, Turkeyfoot, stood atop a large rock and urged the warriors to make a final stand. Resistant to the end, he was shot in the chest while on top of the rock. This exemplifies the blow to native leaders during this battle. While the casualty numbers were relatively low, the Confederacy lost many chiefs and war leaders, while they desperately tried to lead, rally and fight alongside their men. The withdrawal soon turned into a shattered route. The open area beyond the ravine was favorable terrain for cavalry, and the Legion's dragoons made quick work of natives caught there. Any forces that managed to make it to Fort Miami's quickly found the gates were locked. The British refused to allow refuge for the natives, as the commander was unwilling to inadvertently start a direct war with the Americans. The remnants of the Confederacy forces fled north, where they refused to rally due to the abandonment by the British in Fort Miami's. While the casualties on both sides were relatively low, the impact of the Battle of Fallen Timbers was profound for the United States and the U.S. Army. The victory of the Legion allowed for the consolidation of control over the Northwest Territories, which resulted in rapid expansion and settlement of those areas. The success of the campaign demonstrated to Congress, and indeed to many anti-federalists, that a standing army would be necessary to safeguard the future of the young nation. Relying entirely on militia was simply insufficient. On the 3rd of August 1795, as a direct result of the Legion's campaign and the Battle of Fallen Timbers, leaders of the Native American Confederacy signed the Treaty of Greenville, ending the Northwest Indian War. In 1796, Wayne accepted the handover of all the British forts, including Fort Niagara and Fort Lerneau, that were located within U.S. territory in violation of the 1783 Treaty of Paris. The campaign had achieved all of its objectives. The Legion of the United States would soon after be dissolved and integrated into a more contemporary army comprised of regular infantry, artillery and cavalry regiments. While the radical organization and tactics of the Legion were successful, 
Congress decided that it would be cheaper to recruit and outfit a more conventional army. General Wayne may have been able to save the Legion, or at least continue to emphasize the merits of combined arms and irregular warfare. However, his efforts would be undone in his absence. General Wayne would die while being the target of treachery. Wayne's second-in-command, General James Wilkinson, was a Spanish spy who, in exchange for gold, campaigned heavily to ruin General Wayne's reputation, pass information on the American military to the Spaniards, and commit general treachery. General Wayne died just before he was about to court Marshal Wilkinson. This was never found out by Congress, and thus Wilkinson rose to be in charge of the army following Wayne's passing. He was never convicted of his treason, and we only know of his actions today from the release of records of correspondence with various Spanish officers. Multiple American legends fought at Fallen Timbers. Most notably among them, William Henry Harrison, the future ninth president of the US, was present as General Wayne's aide-de-camp. Additionally, William Clark fought in the battle, with Meriwether Lewis being present with the Legion for the signing of the peace treaty. The first, second, third and fourth sub-legions would become the first, second, third and fourth infantry regiments following the disbanding of the Legion. All would take part in the War of 1812. The first, second and third sub-legions have direct ties of lineage in modern infantry regiments, with the oldest, the first sub-legion, having its lineage carried on to this day with the modern third US infantry regiment, the old guard that is in charge of army ceremonial duties as well as eternally guarding the tomb of the unknown soldier. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed hearing about the Legion of the United States. It is a topic that has fascinated me for a long time and I am glad I can try to share it. Next week I will cover the career of General Mad Anthony Wayne in the Revolution, with emphasis on his daring night raid at Stony Point. Please consider leaving a like, or perhaps even to subscribe. I will continue to tell these stories of heroism and valor regardless, so you might as well grab your seat by the fire. I hope to see you all in the breach.